Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Nicole Lederer. I am chair and co-founder of Environmental Entrepreneurs, or E2. And I'm delighted to be with you today, especially because I know this room is full of um, the thought leaders in sustainability of some of the world's largest companies, which coincidentally have some of the world's, um, not coincidentally, have some of the largest footprints in terms of energy use and resource management in the world as well. And I also know that many of you here today are generating the innovations that will become the industry standards going forward. So our purpose today um, is to highlight the impact of clean tech policy on your businesses, regardless of which sector you're in, um, and to inspire you to become actively engaged in clean economy policy advocacy, because if you're not doing it, no one else is representing your interests. Now, some of you might wonder what the appropriations process in Washington, D.C. right now has to do with you, or the infrastructure bill, or even the farm bill. And I would argue that they are all major opportunities to advance the clean economy and your positions within it. So it's my pleasure to introduce my colleagues here today. John Powers is chairman and co-founder of Clean Capital, a financial technology company that makes it easy to invest in clean energy. John has had numerous roles in military and public service. After serving in the US Army in Iraq, he helped revolutionize the Army's energy program at the Pentagon and was then appointed by President Obama as federal chief sustainability officer where he oversaw energy and environmental performance across government operations. Dr. Emily Reichert is CEO of Greentown Labs, the largest clean technology startup incubator in the United States. Emily has spearheaded the growth of Greentown Labs in a global center, into a global center for clean technology innovation and shapes policy on innovation, economic development, and clean tech commercialization. Tommy Hayes is the policy partnerships manager at Lyft, where he manages engagement with partners and government agencies to advocate for transportation sustainability, road safety, and accessibility. He spearheaded many of Lyft's engagements on climate and smart growth policy, and he's a founding member of Lyft's internal sustainability team. So thank you very much for, for being here today. And I'd like to start with you, Emily, because you operate at the, um, at the, the inception phase of business development. <laughs> How does public policy affect innovation and the growth of the new companies that you work with? Excellent. Well, thank you, Nicole. And it's great to be here today at Green Biz. This is my first time at the conference, and so I'm just excited to hear from all the great speakers we have um, throughout the day and throughout the conference. So in terms of how federal policy affects really both the startups themselves, but those who are the consumers of the innovation that the startups create, I would think about it this way. So if you consider the types of startups that I work with, these are companies that are typically at a, a fairly early stage. They might be one to two people. They might have a technology that's coming out of a university. And they need to convince someone that they have something that is really an innovation that can scale. How are they going to get there? Well, this is the thing about clean tech companies. So clean tech companies are usually building something physical. And at Greentown Labs, we have 100,000 square feet, 40,000 of that that is lab space devoted to helping startups to build physical products. Now, if you're a software company, you know, when you think of startup, you think of software. A lot of times, you could build a company in a coffee shop. You can't do that when you are a startup working in clean tech and building a sensor that's going to help a home or a business be more energy efficient. So you really need somewhere to build, and you need time and money to be able to build that thing to the point where it can be taken up and really have a broad impact as it scales. So, in clean tech, there's often a gap, a gap between that very early stage idea coming out of a university lab and the take up of the product or idea by a large corporation who's going to have that innovation and be able to scale it with their resources. And so 
that gap is often supported by a federal fund or policy that allows you to pay for that particular part of the development. So great examples are the SBIR program, the Small Business Innovative Research Grant. And I could say from the companies that we have had at Greentown Labs, which now number about 130 over the past five years, I'd say probably close to 40% have benefited from that program. And that program is really helping companies to pay for that very early stage part, to test and evaluate their technology before it's really ready to scale and become a product. And so SBIRs can come from numerous, numerous government agencies, but to give a few examples, DOE, the Department of Energy, uh, USDA, um, the NSF, and several others are often um, the awarders of these funds for these early stage companies. Oh, other key programs that are important to startups include the ARPA-E program, and that is basically a high risk, high reward uh, type of funding that basically takes very uh, innovative, exciting ideas from universities and helps them get out of the university where they can be, again, where there can be uptake by a commercial partner and then get the um, innovation to scale. So these are pretty critical programs when you think about it. You can't do this work in a coffee shop. You need some funding to pay for your engineers, to pay for your prototypes, to pay for the things that you need to begin to build a clean tech company. And so these programs can often provide that very early and frankly not very big amount of capital, we're talking 100,000 to maybe a million, that can get you on your way and really help get that clean tech product out into the world where it can truly have an impact. Thanks. John, uh, finance is a really policy sensitive arena. How does policy impact your ability to finance renewable energy projects and what implications does that have on the whole ecosystem of renewable energy and the companies that depend on that energy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, let me come back to the finance piece and just give in a, in a second, but give two examples of in the solar space policies and their implications, right? Uh, the investment tax credit about two years ago got extended by Congress. This is about a 30% part of your construction of your solar projects. And it got extended out for five years, right, with a ramp down. Now, that consistency, right, having that outlook to say, okay, we, we know this is in place, helps us be able to, to price that into a deal and know how to manage it as the growth of the solar market continues. But recently, if you uh, pay attention to the space, you know President Trump put down a tariff on solar panels uh, at just a few short weeks ago. Um, I won't talk about whether it's a good or bad idea, um, but is it a bad idea? The <laughs> But the three to four months prior to that, there were no deals getting done. The reason is that people literally did not know how to price solar panels, the price of the solar panel, into the model to finance a deal, right? And that, that inconsistency really hurt the market. And we'll, we'll, I think we'll see a blip in Q1 and Q2 for sure and, and a number of projects installed. But as now you can actually price it in, there's other ways to, to pressure the deal, to, to get the prices that many of you are looking for to buy your electricity from, that now we can price in and figure out over the course of that long-term uh, capital. Now, the more, another one on a state level, and for those of you who are responsible for buying energy for your companies, you are really dealing, federal policy is almost getting put to the side at this point because it's all about the states and you're buying 50, in, in 50 different regimes, right? You're buying in California, it could be completely different than buying in Texas, completely different than buying in Kansas or the Northeast. So you've got to understand those regimes. An issue like net metering, right? When Nevada pulled their net metering briefly last year, that significantly affected the ability of the market to price and, and, and finance those deals. Many of the Fortune 100s, Fortune 50s don't want to own the solar panels in their roof. So they look at companies like Clean Capital because we'll finance them and own them, and our mission is to try to bring new capital to clean energy. Why does that matter? Less than half a percent of institutional capital today is invested in the clean energy space. Why is that? 
just a few short years ago, this is a new market, new technologies. Do we even know the sunshine enough in New Jersey and these panels were going to work? Now, it's a, solar looks like a lot like a real estate transaction. But the more consistency we have, the more long-term, patient, and more important, cheaper capital, like pension funds, uh, life insurance companies, infrastructure funds, can come into the market. 64% of our projects today are soft costs, meaning we need to bring down those costs. And a lot of that is the financing. So if we can bring down those costs, consistent policy makes a big piece. And I'll talk a little bit later about the role that you should have in engaging those policymakers. Tommy Lyft is the is the big the big company on the stage right now, and um, with the best socks. <laughs> with, without <laughs> Thanks a doubt. Thanks for noticing, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, describe the specific policies that Lyft is engaging in, and why. Certainly. So thank you, Nicole, and thank you all for being here today. Um, it's pretty easy for Lyft to figure out what are the policies in our face that really govern the ride-sharing industry, but um, we also try to think about what tangential uh, policies and perhaps what environmental policies impact our ability to advance our mission. So that's the lens we take. Um, I can get, I'll get to a couple of examples, but um, especially as a growing company, and I think this will sound familiar to many in the room, you know, you're often asked to weigh in on things that may or may not seem you know, directly applicable um, to your core business, but our, our mission is fairly uh, audacious. It's to improve people's lives through the world's best transportation. One of those three pillars, besides uh, economic empowerment and social impact, is sustainability. So what that means is, are we able to be an accelerator for the shift away from single occupant vehicle rides, excessive car ownership, traffic congestion, air pollution, and how, you know, how can we um, get people into transportation as a service and thinking differently about owning their cars or perhaps not owning their cars or as many cars. There are so many things that factor in um, to you know, what is going to compel people to live car light or car free. And that includes infrastructure, um, that includes the quality of the other alternative options such as public transit uh, in their cities. And so we go to bat for good public transit and funding. So um, in Seattle, we backed uh, Sound Transit's ST3 bond measure um, about a year and a half ago, $50 billion to improve the light rail system. Um, in the Bay Area where I'm from, Measure BB, which was the BART bond to help um, kind of modernize and, and improve uh, that commuter rail system because we think we're better in a context where people have great public transit to complement a car light lifestyle. So they may take BART to work and they may take a lift home if they've um, you know, had a drink after work and, and the trains are running less frequently. Those kinds of things uh, we're compelled to think about and we want to think about what is our role in helping kind of craft um, the context that we're, we're operating. A couple of other things briefly, um, you know, utilities in California are by SB 350 um, compelled to come up with uh, transportation electrification proposals. Some of those are really innovative ideas to say, how can we get ride-sharing drivers better access to electric vehicles and charging infrastructure? And so while we are still a startup and we have to be laser focused on our core business, um, with the extra time that we have, we try to take a peek around the corner and say, what are the other things? Um, and as a, you know, a passionate environmentalist, um, I feel really empowered to say, how do we think about what's an appropriate way for us to engage? Not to play politics, but to say, how does this policy ladder up to our core mission. Thanks, Tommy. We're going to go to very short one-minute answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, Emily, uh, what is policy that stimulates innovation? Why is policy that stimulates innovation at the, at the incubator level significant to larger companies? Well, I'd say that larger companies come to us. We actually work with 41 corporate partners right now. They come to us because they're seeking innovation, talent, new ideas, and just access to an environment uh, that can be enriching and kind of gets you out of your everyday existence to, to really come up with new ideas and new innovation. And so why is it important that policy would support uh, innovation at incubators? It's basically to provide that opportunity, fill that gap um, that really exists between Again, the time that companies are at a very early stage and the time that they need to get to market. 
those are the type of innovations and ideas that companies, large companies are seeking, and there really needs to be support for that time in a startup's existence so that they have the opportunity to grow until they're ready uh, to be uptake, uh, to be taken up into the market where the innovation can have a larger impact. Thanks, and, and John, you have sat on both sides of the policy table. You've been a policy maker and you've been a policy advocate. As a policy maker, what was your experience with business advocates? How did they influence your decisions and what was the most effective way for them to approach you? Yeah, so raise your hand if your company has a government relations shop. Right. So most of the bigger companies do, a lot of smaller companies don't. Um, and oftentimes we would meet with the government relations folks. When I was at the White House or the Pentagon, and I know my friends on Capitol Hill would, and it's always good to hear that perspective, but here's your dirty little secret about Washington, D.C. and state capitals. The policymakers don't actually know that much about these issues, right? So if you're a legislative director in a congressman's office on Capitol Hill, you may have energy, defense, and health care in your portfolio. There's no way you can know all the things about energy, health care, and defense, right? So what's helpful is when the actual folks doing the work can come in and have that conversation about how this policy may affect them in the real world. Uh, the E2 members from, that Nicole uh, often shepherds to Washington are an incredibly valuable voice because they come in from all over the country and say, this is how what the Clean Power Plan is going to do for me to create jobs in your district, and this is how it actually works. And so those voices can be incredibly powerful. And you know, I think each of you should sort of take your homework uh, following this conference and try to take a trip either to your local capital or to Washington to be an advocate, uh, coordinate with your government affairs if you've got one. If you don't, find an industry group or an organization like E2 that will do all the legwork for you. And you just have to show up and tell your story. Right? That's the most valuable part. So I'm going to ask you a lightning question starting with Tommy and then going down the line. Uh, name the policy or law that um, is having the biggest impact on your sector right now and the policy that you'd most like to support in the near future. Sure, so we haven't seen the infrastructure bill yet come out of Washington, but we're eagerly awaiting that um, and we'll be excited to engage and be supportive um, of opportunities to improve our infrastructure and to ensure that ride sharing and transit systems like I mentioned can can work together better um, and the other thing I would say is electric vehicle um, charging infrastructure that's a big piece of the built environment that's going to um, really help dictate you know the, the future we move into with hopefully you know shared electric autonomous vehicles that's looking down the line but I think um, the public sector has a big role to play in uh, charging infrastructure uh, I so from Clean Capital's perspective, we're buying operating solar projects, so projects that might have six years left or 15 years left on a power purchase agreement will come in at year six, buy it out, and own it. So that core business, is we need the consistency in policy. By the way, if anyone's got solar projects for sale, please let us know. Um, the other, but the real thing that excites me is what's going on in the transformation of the way our power is provided to us and the distributed generation piece. It's hard to say there's one specific policy that's driving that because right now you've got the rev proceedings in New York, you've got things going on in California. So the issues driving that distributed generation I think are going to be the, what's going to give us a 21st century grid. Well, I want to highlight a particular program uh, that is based in Massachusetts and I think could be a great model for other states as well. And that's something called the Innovate Mass program. And we call everything mass something in Massachusetts, so that's why mass is at the end of it. Um, but the general idea is that it is trying to address that gap that I've been talking about. It uh, pairs a startup company with typically a larger corporate partner or customer and provides matching funding to help that startup company test their technology in partnership with the corporate or the customer. And that's a pretty important program for getting a startup company uh, beyond that gap. And as far as looking in the future, I'd say anything related to energy storage is very critical from a policy perspective. And in Massachusetts, we're certainly taking a leadership role there 
as are California and New York. So I'm hopeful to see even more of that in more states. Great. I'm going to wrap up uh, with the following thoughts. Um, everybody in this room is directly affected by policy. That is the framework in which you do business. Don't leave that huge determining factor to your business outcomes to others who might not share your goals. Um, if you're acting alone, join an industry group, join your industry group, or join a, a business advocacy group like Environmental Entrepreneurs, which is a platform for business advocacy for a clean economy. If you have a government affairs team, or if you are the government affairs team, mm -hmm. be sure you have resources directed at advocating for clean energy and climate and the clean economy. Um, there is a secret that I'd like to share with everyone in the room. Uh -oh. uh. You'll have to hear the secret. 1.30 today, we'll continue the conversation. Thanks. And thanks to my panelists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys.